great start. That's on me. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of changings with baptisms today, and so that is not on our incredible tech team. But good morning. My name is Rob. Glad you are here. Those of you joining us on live stream because it's Super Bowl Sunday and you got to get every, all the food ready, the wings ready. Just all I got to say is fly, eagles, fly. Fly, eagles, fly, right? Thank you, Brian. At least one person's with me. A lot going on in our world, just even this past week. I mean, I've been following a couple of different things. One uh, incredible thing happening, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, there's a small college called Asbury College, and there's a revival that's been happening there. They've been worshiping for over 70 hours nonstop. People are coming from around, confessing sin, coming to faith in Christ. It's a movement of holiness, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, It's just exciting to see how the Spirit is falling on that campus right now. We just, I I can't wait to just see what God is going to continue to do. And I'm just praying that that thing spreads. There's other things going on in our world that aren't as exciting. Uh, Many of you have been praying for the people of Syria and Turkey, and we're just going to pause for just a moment and do the same here. Uh, 23 million displaced Syrians call Turkey home. And many of them, 24,000 people have lost their life. And that number they're expecting to double And it's just a massive tragedy after this earthquake. So would you just join me in praying for those in that region of the world? Jesus, we declare that one day you will return and all wrongs will be made right. This isn't the way it's intended to be. And yet it's our reality now. And so I pray that you would send your peace, your presence, and your comfort to the people that are mourning to the rescue workers who are tired, to those who find themselves without shelter and not sure what is next, would you come and reveal yourself to them? Lord, we ask for you to just come and bring a peace, absorb the chaos that is happening in this region of the world right now. Would you be with the people and would you even pursue many of them who don't know you, the majority that don't know you through this event? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you are interested in supporting that, we have part of our movement, the Alliance. We have boots on the ground there. We have people that are already there beginning to just care for people. You can go to commaservices.org. That is our relief and development arm. And you can be generous there if the Lord is calling you to that. Speaking of generosity, thank you to the many of you who call this place home and regularly give to our ministry fund. For many of you who have joined us in the last few months, I'd love to invite you just as a worship with your tithes and offerings to join us in that our ministry fund does so much around here and there's multiple ways that you can give there's there's some boxes there in the lobby you can give through the app you can give uh, online by also sending in a check but when you give to the ministry fund it allows so many things to happen just this past week I was in a worship service with some of our older individuals our senior saints and we were just having a hymn sing-along earlier one of the mornings there's probably 60 to 80 uh, people in there it was just so powerful to see our senior saints worshiping in spirit and in truth with such an Enthusiasm. It just took me back to what happened the week before when I was with over 200 of our young adults worshiping, and that was just this powerful night as well. I don't know how many times they said, hey, here's our last song, maybe five times. They said, here's our last song, but nobody would leave. And, and when you give to, to our ministry fund, it allows these types of events to happen. It also allows events like Night to Shine to happen. How many of you were here on Friday night, right? We had thank you to our army of over 500 volunteers that showed up to welcome are over 200 guests with special needs. Hey, we already got a video put together. We just want to celebrate what God did here. The church at its best Friday night. Would you check out this video? What are you most excited for? I'm just excited to be here at night to shine and get my dance on. Yeah. <laughs> Is this your first time? Yes. You're yes. going to get your dance I, on? Yes. I've, I've always wanted to come to Night to Shine. I've heard my friends talking about it, and it sounds like a really awesome event. And I, yeah, yeah so I've been waiting for this all week. Something God knows how hard I've tried 
But I'm finding that there's nothing like the magic in your eyes. Everybody wants to be somebody. Everybody wants to be someone. Everybody wants to be somebody, but I just want to be somebody to you. Somebody to you. Somebody to you. I could travel. such an awesome night and so thank you again to those of you that gave to make this possible to those of you that served with your time to make this possible uh, what a great great night we are in our series unexpected king and we have a full service today in fact one of the things that we're doing that's unexpected today is at the end of the sermon we're going to actually get to baptize a couple of people that are scheduled to get baptized but we're also opening it up for spontaneous baptisms today and so if you are here even today, I want you just, if something is stirring in you and you have never been baptized, you have that opportunity at the end of the service, and I'll explain more about that when we get there. But first, let me just jump into the word. We're talking today about this unexpected authority that our king is given, and we're going to be looking in the book of Matthew. In our series, we're looking at seven or different narratives of God in the book of Matthew. And so we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 8, 23 to 27. I'm going to jump in. This is when Jesus calms a storm. We're going to just put it up here on the screen for you. You're welcome to look in your pew Bibles. We'll be reading from the New Living Translation. It says this, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. And then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. 
It's important to know the context of where this is happening. Jesus has inaugurated his ministry. He is declaring that the kingdom of God is happening. He is healing people. There's a, his just words are going out. He's talking about it in parables. He's having to explain it, and he's chosen his 12. Much of his ministry has been happening on the western side of this lake of the Sea of Galilee, this area called Capernaum, and he continues to minister there with his group of disciples. At this point in the story, the chances are they're pretty exhausted. They've been seeing some amazing things happen. And Jesus has taken them even aside and explained more in detail about what is happening. But at this point, he says, let's get in a boat. We're going to go somewhere together. My assumption is that a lot of the disciples are like, Jesus, before we get in this boat, man, where are we going? And I would assume that Jesus preparing them for ministry, preparing them to be on mission might even just tell them, you'll figure it out when we get there. Because oftentimes when you are on mission with God, you don't know what's next. You don't have control. And so say he's doing that. I think in their minds, they're thinking, well, there's probably two places we could go. One I want to go to, one maybe I don't want to go to. The first would be maybe the boat would go north. And it would sail north to this little place called Bethsaida. Bethsaida is this little village that's a fishing and hunting village where Jesus would often go for his Sabbath rest. And the disciples at this point are tired, and so is Jesus. And so many of them might be assuming that's where we're going to head. Because the only other option would be to go all the way across the lake to the eastern side to the Decapolis cities. That heathen land, that land where the peace and the power and presence of Jesus has not yet gone to Gentile territory. And they've heard the stories of what is happening over there. And that is not where they're probably hoping they would go. In fact, I would assume they're thinking, would this rabbi really take us? over there is not his message as our future Messiah for us, the Jewish people. And yet they start to head in that direction. And I just imagine what they're sensing as the boat takes off, this Jesus going to blaze a new trail, going to bring his message to these 10 new cities in Gentile territory. It's where the boat is headed. In church family, it's important for us to understand that we're headed in a similar direction. We're headed into uncharted territory. See, the kingdom of God is happening through us. We are bringing the peace and the presence and the power of Jesus wherever we go. Our gifts and our passions are being unleashed, and we're figuring out what our unique part in the going forth of the kingdom of God is. And therefore, there are some lessons that we can see in this story for us. You see, here in our text, we see pretty quickly that being on mission with Jesus doesn't mean that everything's going to go well. In fact, what happens? Right away, they're in this boat, and they face this massive storm. And this isn't any normal storm. Remember, there's fishermen in this boat. They know this sea very well. And it's really not that big of a sea. I've been there. You can see the other side pretty easily. And yet... It says they're terrified. They think they're going to drown. They're caught off guard. The Gospel of Mark says that there were other fishing boats out there when they left. And because of that, we know that this isn't just something that came up that they didn't plan for. No, this is actually a spiritual encounter. We know that. Jesus didn't miss checking the weather app. No, this is like a massive spiritual force that is coming against him to hinder his message going forth. In fact, we see in the way that he rebukes and takes care of this, we see he is using language that is the same that he uses when he is practicing spiritual authority. You see, in in Mark, in the first chapter of Mark, we see Jesus is in the synagogue, and there's a demon-possessed man that comes up to him and says, I know who you are. And he quickly takes control of the setting, and he says, be quiet. He says, be quiet, come out of him. In the original Greek, it's actually the same exact words that Jesus is using to deal with the storm. He says, be quiet, come out of him. And it's fascinating because the reaction is the same. In both, we see his unexpected authority. In Mark chapter 1, it says that the people that were there said, wow, a new teaching. And not only a new teaching, a new teaching that has this authority behind it. Even the impure spirits listen and submit to this person. And here, now in the boat, the same thing, a new authority. Even the wind and the waves come under this person's authority. It's a powerful, powerful thing. But what we see in it is that when we go on mission, we hit hindrances. We hit roadblocks, and we should actually expect them. The first thing I see here is the boat is headed on a strategic mission, and the enemy acts early 
to try to hinder, to try to thwart the mission. I believe this is important for us to understand as a church because as many of us are unleashed into our calling, we will face similar things. We will come up against roadblocks. We will face different things. There's 120 people in our church going through soul care intensive groups right now, looking to get free of different things, looking to forgive and process things. Those of you walking through that, expect the enemy. He doesn't want you free. He's coming for you. We have a team in Thailand right now that is bringing the truth of Jesus to these little villages along the border towns. This week, they handed out 600 pairs of sunglasses, 600 reading glasses. They're seeing people get healed, and they're working with these Thai pastors that are planting these little micro-communities of faith. In the, it's amazing. The kingdom of God is at hand. We're seeing six to seven new families show up at Sam Alliance every single week because the kingdom of God is beginning to move. Peace is being released, and we need to understand when that happens, when the kingdom of light comes against the kingdom of darkness, there will be a retaliation. And I know, and for some of us, this begins to create almost a level of anxiety and nervousness, and I'm sorry about that, but my purpose isn't to to do that. I, I, I do apologize for that, but my goal is to normalize that. That when God is at work, the enemy is not happy. And for those of you that are new to faith, he wants to come in and the enemy wants to sow doubt. For those of you that have had an inner revival or renewal recently, the enemy is going to lie to you and he's going to tell you that is simply an emotional high that that you've experienced. For some of you that have been released into new levels of gifts and passions, the enemy is going to tell you, who do you think you are? You're not special and you don't have influence. And I'm telling you, you are special. You are uniquely created and you do have unique spheres of influence in the kingdom of God needs you. And so we have to be prepared for this. We have to understand that there is a battle that is raging. See, I learned this the really hard way. 18 years ago, when my family felt compelled to move to the Middle East, we, my wife Jess and I and our two little daughters, two years old and four months, we packed up everything into six suitcases and we landed in the country of Jordan. I'd never been to this country. And I'll never forget, we got there in the middle of the night on that first night. And we stayed with some friends that we had met earlier, and they were gladly hosted us. And we fell asleep quickly, and we woke up the next morning, and they said, here's the deal. Eat your breakfast quick, because we're going to go get you some bedroom furniture. We want you to sleep in your own place tonight. We're like, they're intense. Okay, here we go. So we went. We picked out our new bedroom set. It got delivered. It got set up. That first night, we're staying in our own place. New language, new culture, new city of 5 million people. One cell phone. We fall asleep that night. A few hours later, in the middle of the night, my daughter wakes up. My two-year-old wakes up with a fever that is so high that she's hallucinating. She can't get things off her that actually don't exist. I've never been so frightened and helpless and no control over this situation in my life. We didn't have medicines. We didn't know any places that were open. We didn't know what to do. Our phone had one number in it. We couldn't wake him up. I'll never forget taking my daughter in the arm. I remember the street very vividly and just walking down the street with her, praying that I could find a taxi to get me to the ER. I remember interceding. I remember thinking, what in the world am I doing here? Why am I here? What is going on? I'll never forget that moment. That feeling just crushed me. I was able to find a taxi, and as he began to take me to the hospital, I recognized the one street that I had been on, the house where I had stayed the night before, and I told the taxi, pull over, pull over. He was able to understand me, and I woke up this other family that we knew, and they were able to get me quickly to the hospital where my daughter was able to get the medicine she needed to get the fever down. But Jess was home with no cell phone. What was two hours felt like two days for her. And I'll never forget walking in that apartment with my daughter in my arms saying, we're going to be okay, in the relief that came over her. But we quickly, in tears, realized that we were in a battle. She said, Rob, when the sun came up and the moss began to go off, it felt like there was a spiritual being in this room. I've been praying this whole time. And we put our kids on that bed and we prayed again. And we reminded that to be on mission, sometimes you lose control. What ended up being 12 years in the Middle East almost ended on day one. Because when you are on mission, the enemy wants to act early to stop you, to hinder you, to thwart that mission. And we need to be aware. It's what happens when we take new ground. 
But there's so much more that we see in this little story, in this little narrative, because it's more than just this spiritual warfare or this power encounter. What really grabs my attention is even what happens after the waves are calm, after they've seen this guy they're following have this incredible authority. Matthew says that they respond and that they're amazed. But the gospel writer Mark, talking about the same exact story, says that they're actually terrified. In Mark 4, it says this. It says the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? You could interpret this also. You could say they were anxious. They were nervous. There's different translations that would say different things here. And I think it's important for us to recognize that the sea is calm. They're not going to drown. And yet their reaction is one of amazement and one of anxiety. And it's important that we need to know this because being anxious when on mission is actually a pretty normal feeling. Being anxious, being nervous, feeling just this loss of control when we're on mission is actually a pretty normal feeling. For those that walked with Jesus, this is what they experience all the time. Elements of anxiety, worrisome, being concerned, just nervous about these situations that they were being put in. And look, I'm hesitant to even toss the word anxiety out there because I know many of us in this room struggle with just deep, real anxiety and panic and depression. What I'm talking about when I refer to anxiety here is situational. It's circumstantial anxiety because of loss of control. But that's the thing about the kingdom of heaven. That's the thing about the kingdom of God. When you are on mission, the cost of it, a dis- being a disciple, being on mission with Jesus, costs us our control and it costs us our comfort. That's the price. That's what's asked. I wish it wasn't so. But that's literally the kingdom. Over and over, this is what we see. And these disciples are on the boat, they know it's not going to sink. They know they're safe. They know the one that they're following is the guy, and yet they're terrified. I think it's important. Their fears are confirmed, for they do go to the eastern shore. They get off the boat in the land that is Jordan, and who do they face first? We know the story. They face a demoniac that breaks chains and confronts them. And he casts out the demons into a herd of pigs that run into water. You can't make this stuff up. This stuff is so weird. It's so crazy. But that is the unexpected kingdom of God. If you are a bit hesitant about the personal mission that Jesus is calling you to and inviting you into, can I just say you're not alone? If part of your community, your life group, is nervous about what God is calling you to as a collective community, can I just say, take a deep breath. You're in good company. Even the apostles, even these disciples were nervous. It's important for us to recognize and take heart that it's our loss and our comfort that is gone that it means to be truly a disciple of Jesus. See, we're not signing up for some cozy, rosy, everything goes better with Jesus faith. That's our Western culture over top our scripture. That's not what is there. I know I'm going intense here, and I apologize. As a communicator, this is the time of the sermon where we call come up for air. This is where I should put up a picture of Photoshop Brian Candelo doing something or, you know, I had my phone ready at night to shine, but he didn't hit the dance floor, and so I've got nothing for you this week, but time will come. But I don't want to leave us here because what I also see here is this. None of the disciples say, turn the boat around and let's go back. None of them say it because they're where they know they should be. They are on the front lines. And the final truth I see here is that engagement, though risky, is where we want to be. It's where we want to be. Anytime there's a level of expansion or growth in anything, it's going to be risky. Going from two kids to three kids, my goodness, we're outnumbered. What are we thinking? Yet I wanted that more than anything. Having four, you're doubling up. Are you kidding me? Why would you have four kids? Yet, it's so exciting. It's the same thing when you start a business and you got to hire those first employees that aren't family and it's risky and it's intense. What's going to happen? C1, C2, how are you guys doing? Thanks for joining us. You guys are here for baptisms. Middle school is going to come in in a minute. That's the deal that we see here. The front line. Where else would you want to be than the front line? And what I love about this is for some of these disciples... It was a reminder. It was a flashback actually to their calling because there was another time that at least four of these men in the boat with Jesus were on a boat with Jesus that was sinking. And he said, 
Why are you afraid? You see, you know, you know the story. It's in Luke 5. It's the calling of Simon. And Jesus is speaking to this group of people. And he, so many of them, they're pushing. So he gets on Simon's boat and he pushes back and he begins to teach. And after he's done teaching, he says, Simon, go take your boat and catch some fish. And he's like, I, no, I just, I did that all night and I didn't catch anything. It's not the time. And yet Simon obeys and he goes out and he catches so many fish that the boat begins to sink. So he calls his friends, the sons of Zebedee, and they come and they fill their boat. And these two boats began to sink. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Because I'm calling you to be fishers of men. I'm calling you to put you on mission. And in this moment, in this moment, as they just heard his voice again say, don't be afraid, did they flash back to the mission? And do they realize there is no place I'd rather be than on the front lines engaging, watching the kingdom of God move forward with this King Jesus? Church family, I believe they did. I believe they flashed back to that. And I believe there's no place they'd rather be. And church family, I hope the same is for you. The kingdom of God is advancing. Where else are we going to see the transcendent? Where else are we going to see the miraculous? Where else are we going to see captives set free? Where else are we going to see the sick healed? Where else are we going to see joy come upon people like we did at night to shine? Where else are we going to see a unity that transcends culture? Where else are we going to see the peace of God released? Where else are we going to see community provision? Where else would you see kids being this quiet in church? <laughs> So let me wrap this all up. The enemy, he wants to stop it. And we need to rebuke the lie because what he wants you to say is, look, this isn't what I signed up for. We're not signing up for comfort. We're not signing up for the cozy. We are signing up to be ambassadors used by God, each of us a unique creation. The remedy to get through it is to remember that you're not alone. Jesus is in the boat with you, and he's got an incredible level of authority that he delegates to you. And so we can take charge of these situations, but we need to be ready. We need to realize they'll come. We need to speak his name. We need to keep our confessions current. We need to be intercessors. We need to be watchmen because it is happening. And finally, the cost of engagement, it's our control and it's our comfort, and we cannot forget that. Because something good is happening. Let's pray. Jesus, we just declare that you are a great God. And so for those in this room today that are searching, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would make yourself known to them through your undeniable pursuit. For some of us, we have known you for a long time, but if we're to be honest, we're not really a threat to the enemy. So I pray that you would awaken us and that you would keep us from hanging on to control and comfort. Keep us from just walking through the motions. Awaken us in Jesus' name. And for those of us that are starting out on this new mission, there's just this new passion that has been released, and you are calling us to something new. Lord, would you go with us? Would you go with us, and would you protect us? Awaken us to move in obedience and to move in your authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.